St. Peter. St. Peter in our gospel passage today walks on water. It wasn't James, John, Thomas, James, Philip, Bartholomew, Simon, or Jude. It was Peter. Peter is the one who walked on water, and Peter, in two chapters later, will be the apostle. When asked by Jesus, who do people say that I am? It is Peter who will say, you are the Christ, you are the Son of the living God. And it is Peter, in Matthew chapter 16, who will be given the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Directly to the left of St. Joseph here is St. Peter. He's holding the keys of the kingdom of heaven. For 2,000 years, we as Christian people have looked at St. Peter as being the head of the apostles 2,000 years ago, but that his successors are still the head of the church today. Many of you know that just a week ago, I was in Lisbon, Portugal. I can celebrate Sunday Mass with Pope Francis, the successor of St. Peter. There are 1.8 million people at that Mass as we gathered with Peter to celebrate the representation of Calvary. I'd like to speak a little bit about the fruits and the graces of the pilgrimage that Peter himself called us to through the voice of St. John Paul II in the 1980s when he began to look what was happening in the world and began to call the young people of the church to gather on a regular basis. St. John Paul II, the founder of World Youth Day, was continued through, Saint ben through Pope Benedict XVI and now Pope Francis. As you know, there were 70 young adults, young people from Dearborn County that went to World Youth Day. Our pilgrimage began in Rome, in the Eternal City. We arrived at 7.30 a.m. And when you're on a pilgrimage with Father Meyer, there is no rest, ever. We hit the ground. The first thing we did is we went to the catacombs. I wanted to take the young people to experience the early, early church in Rome. The catacombs are over 100 miles of subterranean caverns that have been hand dug and they were built for the purpose of being the cemeteries because we as Christians believe in the body. We believe the body is holy and sacred. Pagan Romans burnt the bodies of their dead and we as Christians distinguish ourselves by not burning the bodies of our beloved dead. We wanted a full body burial because Jesus rose from the dead. And so the Christians went underground with their cemeteries and we walked through a place which is literally the burial place of the early church's martyrs and saints. We venerated the tomb of St. Sebastian, patron saint of athletes and of the military. Saints like St. Saint Philomena were buried in these, in these catacombs. Coming up out of the earth, we visited what is known as the Scala Sancta. Emperor Constantine is the emperor in the 300s who made Christianity legal. His mother was Saint Helen. She made many pilgrimages to the Holy Land. And the Holy Land was already under war and turmoil. And she knew that the Christians in Rome would never go back to the Holy Land. So she decided to bring the Holy Land to Rome, which was the center of the world. So she dismantled in the Praetorium the steps that Jesus ascended and descended on Good Friday. She built a church in the city of Rome where these steps are now reconstructed. And I watched my 70 young people on their knees prayerfully go up every single step praying on their knees on this journey on the exact same steps that Jesus ascended and descended on Good Friday. We visited then St. Helen's Palace, which is now a church as well, Santa Croce in Jerusalem, which has the largest piece of Jesus' cross. It has the placard that hung above Jesus' head saying, I-N-R-I, Jesus the Nazarene, Nazarene King of the Jews. As a nail that went is in his hand, thorns from the crown of thorns, and the finger of doubting Thomas that went into Jesus' side. We then went to our first cathedral. The word cathedral 
is a Latin word which ultimately has its basis in cathedra, which means chair. A cathedral is the church that houses or has within it the chair of the bishop. The cathedral church of the whole entire world, which would be the cathedral church of the Pope, is St. John Lateran. We went out into St. John Lateran, we had a tour. Within that church is the table that Jesus celebrated the Last Supper on. Relics of Peter and Paul. But at the center of that basilica, that cathedral, is the chair that symbolizes all teaching and authority in the world. And we had Mass, and I am not exaggerating. We had Mass that night. There was hardly anyone left in the basilica because we actually were the last Mass at 6 p.m. And this altar is farther away from me than the chair of the cathedral of the world was from us at the celebration of Holy Mass that first night in Rome. That was day one. Day two, we woke up and we went to the Vatican. Now, to clarify, Guy, the word Vatican predates Christianity. The Vatican's was a cemetery. It was known as the Vatican Gardens. St. Peter was arrested. St. Peter was taken to the city of Rome where he was put on trial. He was arrested. He was condemned to death and he was crucified upside down. And he was buried in the Vatican Cemetery. Eventually, Emperor Constantine built a church over his very tomb. Archaeological works in the, in the 1940s went to the bones of St. Peter and they found the bones of a 70-year-old man and all of his bones were present except there were no feet bone. Why would there be no feet bone? Because if you crucify somebody upside down, the easiest way to take them off the cross is to cut off their feet. We arrived at the Vatican. We walked into St. Peter's Basilica, the largest church in the whole entire world, which is built over the very bones of St. Peter. Mass offered throughout the ages by every pope. Throughout our last 2,000 year history, the Pieta of Michelangelo to our right as we walk in. I make my way into the sacristy to get ready for Mass. I have my piece of paper telling me that we have a reservation at the altar of St. Joseph, which is an alt a side altar off to the left. As I walk into the sacristy, they tell me that there's some problems with the St. Joseph altar, and we can't celebrate Mass there. And then they tell us that we're going to celebrate Mass at the principal altar, the main altar in St. Peter's Basilica. For those of you who have been to St. Peter's before, or seen pictures of St. Peter's, and there is this beautiful stained glass window of the Holy Spirit. That window, which was illuminated that morning as we celebrate Holy Mass facing the east, that light shone down upon these 70 pilgrims from our group and about another 40 pilgrims from the Archdiocese of Indianapolis. And I will tell you, it was one of the most powerful Masses I've ever celebrated in my life. And not only were we praying, but because we were at the main altar and the microphone system on, the entire St. Peter's Basilica heard us chanting and praying and offering the representation of Calvary just literally feet away from the bones of St. Peter himself. After Mass, we had a tour of the Vatican Museums, the Sistine Chapel. At that point, I was like, Lord, if we don't do anything else, like, Lord, thank you. We woke up the following morning and we had mass in the third of the four major basilicas in the city of Rome, which is the Basilica of St. Paul. St. Paul, whose image is here on the right, he was beheaded. His body was buried and they built a basilica over his body as they did St. Peter. We had mass once again there at the principal altar at St. Paul's, just feet away from his very body. They have in the basilica of St. Paul the chains that held him in prison on display. We got back on the bus and we went to an area of Rome, not where St. Paul was buried because we were just there, but the place where Paul was executed. It's a place in Rome called Tre Fontane, the Three Fountains. It was there that St. Paul was held in prison and we venerated the place where he was held in prison the night before he was executed. We were able to literally place our hands 
on the first century Roman road that St. Paul would have walked on barefoot to the place of his execution. And in a church at the end of that Roman road is the exact spot where Paul was beheaded. There's a pillar, a column that marks the spot. And then to the left of that column are three tiny shrines to mark the places where his head bounced on the ground three times and springs of water came up. Thus the name of that part of Rome called Tre Fontaune, the three fountains. After that, we got back on the bus and we then went to the fourth major basilica known as Mary Major. St. Helen not only brought back the relics of the Passion, she also bought, brought back the relics of our Lord's birth. And under the high altar at St. Mary Major is the crib of our Lord Jesus Christ, the manger that he was laid in on Christmas night. And our young people, as they approached this high altar, and as they went down to touch the very wood that Jesus was laid in, we began singing Christmas songs, Silent Night, and Oh Little Town of Bethlehem. We came up from this lower part of the church, and we went directly to our left, where in that same church is a famous painting, an icon of our Blessed Mother, Mary holding the child Jesus, that was painted by St. Luke. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's the oldest image of the Blessed Virgin Mary, painted by Luke himself. The ceiling in that church, by the way, is gold from America that the Queen of Spain from Christopher Columbus gifted to the Vatican. While we were in Rome, we decided to see some secular stuff as well. So we went to the Colosseum. We saw the Spanish stairs and Trevi Fountain and the Pantheon and Piazza Navona. We had some pasta. It was fantastic. We did all that in three days. We then got an airplane. We went to, we had a, a nine hour labor in Madrid. So we got off, got onto a train, went into the city. We visited the cathedral, the basilica of St. Francis. We visited three plazas, got back on a train and somehow made it back to the airport on time. All within four hours, I would like to say. It was awesome. We arrived in Lisbon, our ultimate destination that night checked into our hotel, had mass, woke up the next day, and went on pilgrimage to Fatima. Now, in 1917, there were three shepherd children, Lucia, Jacinta, and Francesco, and the Blessed Virgin Mary appeared to them, and she changed the world. When we arrived in Fatima, the first place we went was to the exact place of the apparition. The apparition where Mary appeared to these children was originally a huge grassy field where the children would take their sheep to graze. There was a tree there, and the Blessed Mother always appeared near that tree. Today, where that tree was is a small chapel and a statue of Our Lady. When we arrived, we knelt on the ground, we prayed the rosary in the presence of that spot of the apparition. And as we were there kneeling, we noticed there were other people that were kneeling as well, but they weren't standing still. There's a devotion in Fatima where you start a half mile away from the shrine and you approach the shrine and the chapel of apparition on your knees. On the airplane road from, on the airplane back from World Youth Day, I was talking to a young man from California who was in a seat in front of me. I said, what was the most powerful experience for you on your pilgrimage? And he said, I took the pilgrimage on my knees. And he pulled up his shorts, and he had scabs all over his knees. He offered it for sinners because that's what Mary asked of us to do in Fatima, was to sacrifice and offer penance for the conversion of sinners. We then, after that rosary, we had mass, and in the opening procession, and the procession out of the, the mass, which was said outside with a few thousand people, no big deal, was a beautiful statue of Our Lady of Fatima, but also was our bishop. Our bishop, a good shepherd, our bishop, a good father, went to World Youth Day to be a shepherd to his people. And thanks be to God, he was chosen out of the probably 50 or 60 bishops that were at that mass to sit on the cardinal's right 
during that Mass. And it was a beautiful blessing to think that he's given the sacrament of confirmation to almost every young person on the pilgrimage. At the end of that Mass, we had a quick lunch, and then we headed out to walk the exact path that the three shepherd children would take back and forth feeding their sheep. It's about a mile and a half, two mile walk. And along the way, there's now stations of the cross. But there's also other places. Places where our Blessed Mother appeared in August. Places where angels appeared to the children the two years prior to the apparitions taking place in 1915. 1917. And what's really powerful is that, although you might say, I don't know a lot about Fatima, you really do. When our Blessed Mother appeared to the children of Fatima, she said, when you pray the rosary, I want you to then say this, and I want you to join me. Oh my Jesus, forgive us our sins, save us from the fires of hell, lead all souls to heaven, especially those in most need of my mercy. You say that prayer because of where we were at, and I will tell you that we prayed for you there. We're blessed here at All Saints Parish to have a perpetual adoration chapel. Along the journey where the children would walk back and forth, they were visited by angels. And at one point, one of those angels told the children that they were the guardian angel of Portugal. And they told the children to say a prayer. And that is the prayer that we pray every hour in our adoration chapel. Most Holy Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, I adore you profoundly and offer you the most precious body, blood, soul, and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ present here in all the tabernacles of the world in reparation for the outrages, sacrileges, and indifferences with which he himself is offended and through the infinite merits of the most sacred heart of Jesus, I beg you the conversion of poor sinners. Amen. Every time you say that prayer, you fulfill what the angels asked those three children. We continue now the pilgrimage to the home of Lucia. And our pilgrimage to Fatima was amazing. I at that point said, Lord, if this is it, thanks be to God. The next day, World Youth Day officially began with the opening mass, and that's where God began chasing us. Most people, I think, go to World Youth Day trying to find God. Well, we didn't have a problem with that. Because the grace of our World Youth Day, World Youth Day pilgrimage was that literally God was chasing after us. Every place we went, Every church that we walked into, our Lord was exposed in the Blessed Sacrament. On our first day of World Youth Day, we went into the heart of the city. And this may sound very confusing to you, but there are four historic churches in the center of Lisbon that have become one parish. And those four historic churches, which were all pretty much in walking distance, made a passport encouraging the young people at World Youth Day to visit every church and to make a visit to the Blessed Sacrament. Two of those churches had adoration of the Blessed Sacrament taking place. We went to those churches, we prayed the rosary, and then after you, got, you went to your fourth church, they gave you like a prize. It was awesome, right? But it wasn't just that day that we encountered our Lord twice in the Blessed Sacrament. During the next few days, we would participate in two corporate city processions with Bishop Robert Barron, one of the greatest catechists in the church today. We went to the cathedral church to visit the cathedral of Lisbon. And after we stood a while in line to get in, because there's 1.8 million people in the city, we got literally right to the door, and they shut the door on us and said the cathedral is now closed. And as we began to turn around and walk away, all wearing matching t-shirts. The door reopened and a man came out and said, let that group in. What were we led into? An hour of Eucharistic adoration led by French pilgrims where there is the most beautiful French chanting going on throughout the holy hour of Eucharistic adoration. We prayed the stations with Pope Francis. And then we began our pilgrimage. So the heart of World Youth Day is actually the last day. It's why it's called World Youth Day, even though it's four days of building up to that. The closing mass is on Sunday. There are 1.8 million people at the closing mass. You can't get 1.8 million people to one place by 9 o'clock on a Sunday morning. So people actually begin walking out to the pilgrim site on Saturday. And it takes all day for 1.8 million people to gather. 
When we went to World Youth Day in Panama, a group of us afterwards like, we're going to do something different when we go to World Youth Day next in Lisbon. We're going to leave as early as we possibly can on Saturday so we can beat the crowds. And we're going to bring an altar with us and we're going to celebrate Mass in the field and have adoration all day. So earlier in the week, I told my pilgrims, I was like, hey, like, we need to find some boxes or something. I don't know how we're going to have an altar in the field, but like, God will just provide. Well, lo and behold, God provided. Why? Well, because our hotel was next to a Chinese restaurant. And many of us were often hungry late at night, so we started going to this, uh, this Chinese restaurant. And I went to the Chinese restaurant. I told my whole pilgrim, I said, would you please just pray? Because this Chinese restaurant had like outdoor seating and they had what we would call in America, uh, like a TV tray that you would eat like a TV dinner on or whatever. And um, so I went in, I bought some sweet and sour chicken. And at the end of my meal, I said a Hail Mary, and I walked up to the owner, and I was like, hi, I'm from America, and we're living here at this hotel, and we're going to go and see Pope Francis, and I need your table, and I want you to give it to me so I can take it out into a field. <laughs> and he was so excited. He was like, yes, yes, you can have my table. So I asked four of the young adult men that were going to become my Ark of the Covenant committee. And they were in charge of carrying the table out into the field. And so we broke it down into pieces, and we set off as early as we possibly could on Saturday morning. And we arrived out in the field, and God blessed us with one of the hottest days in the history of Portugal. There was not a cloud in the sky. We celebrated Holy Mass, and then we exposed the Blessed Sacrament. I brought a tiny little monstrance with me. And then this is when, like, everything changed. Because these 70 pilgrims from Dearborn County offered to the young people of the world a refuge and an oasis of grace in the midst of what was chaos. And our pilgrims who came and adored Jesus, some of them said that that was the most powerful experience they had. Watching people from every tribe and nation and language and skin color be surprised by finding Jesus and falling to their knees. People from other countries coming up to us and just thanking us for having mass and adoration present in the field. I gave benediction and we ended adoration only for one reason. Why? Because we were having adoration that night with Pope Francis and receiving benediction from him. We then went to bed. Well, we tried. We were sleeping on the rockiest field I think that God could have given us. It was awesome. I really enjoyed every rock. They rocked my world. I woke up at 4.30 in the morning to gather with the three other priests from our diocese. Where we were at was about a mile away from the papal altar. So as priests woke up at 4.30, we then went through security and eventually uh, we gathered with 10,000 other priests. There were 10,000 concelebrating priests at the Mass. This is the vestment that all of the priests were given for the celebration of the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. The vestment has the logo of World Youth Day on it back here. The theme of World Youth Day was the visitation, going in haste. Pope Francis encouraged the young people of the world to go in haste, to bring the gospel to the world where the gospel has not been preached. Thus, the vestment is supposed to look like a road or a journey. The two predominant colors are red and green, of course, from the flag of Portugal, but the yellow and the gold in the center is supposed to be the Holy Spirit. We can do nothing without the Holy Spirit. And this same image is replicated throughout the vestment as a reminder of the whole world going in haste, consecrated to Our Lady of Fatima to change the world, to set the world on fire. So I arrived, got my seat, prayed with these other priests as we prepared for the celebration of Holy Mass. And then we noticed that Mass began 15 minutes early. There's a reason it started 15 minutes early. The health officials, thanks be to God in Portugal, were like, there are 1.8 million people and the heat index for Sunday was 110 degrees. So Mass started at 845. It was absolutely beautiful. It was glorious. It's fantastic. At the end of Mass, they announced that World Youth Day was going to be in Seoul, Korea in 2027. I'm like, yes. So then we started the pilgrimage back. 
Now, I want to go back to what Our Lady, fed, Our Lady said in Fatima. Our Lady asked those children to do penance and to offer up sacrifices and sufferings for the conversion of sinners. And I will tell you, at that moment, what happened in Portugal was exactly what Our Lady asked for. Communal suffering is really powerful. People don't suffer very well by themselves. How many people do you know that wake up on a Saturday morning like, hey, I'm going to go run 26 miles today. But they'll pay $110 to run a marathon with a few thousand other people. People don't sign up for Spartan races and Tough mutters by themselves. No one's like, hey, I'm going to go run through some mud and jump off a cliff and climb under barbed wire by myself. But I'll pay $70 to do it with a few thousand other people. Portugal then set 1.8 million kids out into the streets. Our pilgrims walked six miles back in 110 degree weather. And many of them did it with singing, praying the rosary, and reflecting upon the graces that God gave them. That night, after a very much needed shower and rest, we gathered with our own bishop, Archbishop Charles Thompson, in the dining room of our hotel. And our young people stood up and gave testimonies and witnesses of how God had touched their heart. Twice since then, Archbishop Thompson has sent me an email thanking me and regretting that he did not spend more time with our pilgrims because of the schedule of the bishops having to give talks and security and all of those things. What a grace for him, but what also what a grace for us. One might think the pilgrimage was over, but it wasn't. The next day we woke up, we got on a bus, and we went to a small town very close to Fatima called Santarem, the home of one of the Eucharistic miracles that the blessed Carlos Acutis had on display last year at our Eucharistic exhibit at our festival. The miracle of Santarem is a powerful miracle. In the 1200s, there was a woman who was in a struggling marriage who kept praying for the conversion of her husband. Her husband wouldn't convert. She eventually gave up on God. And she went to a witch, a sorceress, in the town. And for those of you who don't believe that Jesus is present in the Blessed Sacrament, just so you know, those who commit sins of sacrilege, those who believe in witchcraft and sorcery, do believe that Jesus is truly present in the Blessed Sacrament. Because this woman was asked by this witch to go and steal a host from the church. So she went to Mass, she knelt down, she received communion on the tongue, she took Jesus out of her mouth, she wrapped it in her veil, and she left the church. As she began to leave the church, Jesus began to bleed, and blood was flowing over her garments. She ran back to her home, she took the host, and she put it in a chest. Her husband came home later that day and found her found his wife kneeling before this chest. She told her the story. She told him the story. And at that moment, the chest burst open, rays of light came out, angels appeared, and he converted instantly. They brought the host back to the church and then had processions, corporate city processions with it throughout the city streets. That same host, which throughout the ages has bled again and again, is still visible, and we had mass in the presence of that host in Santarem. St. Peter, 2,000 years ago, walked on water. Pope John Paul II, the successor of St. Peter, called the youth of the world to come to World Youth Day to encounter Jesus. People ask me all the time, why do you go to World Youth Day? I go to World Youth Day because it works. I go to World Youth Day because people have conversion. I go to World Youth Day because pilgrimage works. I know many of you follow many things on the internet, and I will just tell you that their explanation of World Youth Day doesn't make sense. And their critique of World Youth Day doesn't fall in line with anything that I experienced at World Youth Day. But World Youth Day changed my life, and I know that it changed the lives of 70 others that were with me. I want to thank every single one of you this morning, not only for listening to my long ramblings, but for praying for these young people, financially supporting them, 
and helping them to get to these experiences because it's powerful and it is worth it. I will be going to Seoul, Korea in 2027. I ask of you to pray for the young people that have been with me at World Youth Day. This is my ninth World Youth Day. I, I pray every day. I have a prayer card in my brief. I pray for every young person who has gone to World Youth Day in Rome, in Toronto, in Cologne, in Sydney, in Madrid, in Rio, in Krakow, in Panama, and now the fruits of Lisbon. And I pray in anticipation of the next World Youth Day in Seoul, Korea. Our church needs young people who are convicted. Our church needs young people who know the faith, who love the Lord and the Blessed Sacrament, who love Our Lady. And I am tremendously thankful. So through the intercession of Our Lady of Fatima, through the intercession of St. Peter, through the intercession of St. Paul, through the intercession of St. Blessed Carlos Acutis, we pray for renew renewal and revival. And we pray that we may all be able to walk on water and that our young people will always be on the sure, solid foundation of our apostolic church, rooted and grounded in the apostles. Amen. Amen.